Hello class, this lesson is going to be about the scientific method. The scientific method is the way people go about solving problems in their everyday lives. A lot of people think that are non-science majors that I never do science, but that is simply not true. By you simply picking a product that you like by trial and error is part of the scientific method. So today what I'm going to do is go through the steps of the scientific method and show you how I've incorporated the scientific method into one of my everyday problems. So the scientific method is a series of steps that scientists take in order to solve their problems. So in order to see they have a problem to solve, the first step in the scientific method is to make observations. So they look at the world around them and observe it. From these observations, they then formulate questions or problems. From these problems or questions, they formulate a hypothesis, an educated guess on how to solve that problem or question. From that point, they then go on to test these hypotheses. They test these hypotheses by experimentation. Once they collect the data from their experiments, they then draw conclusions from their results. These conclusions can fit with the scientific evidence or they could go against the scientific evidence. Once these experiments have been concluded, they can share this information with the scientific community through papers and journals. So it's an ongoing process that's tweaked. One thing to keep in mind, in science we can talk about scientific facts. But scientific fact is not the same as a grammatical fact in English or historical fact in history. Scientific facts can be changed as the scientific community gains knowledge about the world around them. So just keep that in mind as we're talking about science. What's true today in science might not be true in 20 years from now. For example, when I was a kid, I believed that Pluto was a planet. Within the last 10 years, we scientists have gained more information, and now Pluto is no longer on the list of planets. How sad for poor Pluto. Okay, so like I said, the first step is observation. So an example from my life, I love coffee. I drink it in the morning, I drink it two cups a day. Um, during the day, I drink two cups, and then at night, I'll come home and I'll drink a cup of coffee. I love coffee. Yes, I'm addicted to caffeine, but I also love coffee. It's my comfort drink. I also have the problem with my teeth, that I have these reoccurring nightmares that my teeth rot and fall out of my head. So I am anal about taking care of my teeth. I brush my teeth three to four times a day. I dental floss every day. I whiten my teeth. So I have this observation that when I drink coffee, it stains my teeth. So that's the first part. So I love coffee, but it stains my teeth, and I have these crazy reoccurring nightmares. So then I could come up with my problem or question. I am not going to stop drinking coffee. So my problem or question is, how can I drink coffee without staining my teeth? That's my question. Step two of the scientific method. Step three would be to formulate a hypothesis. How can I solve this? How can I drink coffee without staining my teeth? And there's many solutions to this. There are so many solutions, but for me and for scientists, you pick one and you go with it. So my hypothesis is, well, it, the definition is an educated guess, an answer to a question, and it has to be stated as fact. It's a declarative statement. It's objective, it pertains to everyone, there's no personalization about the statement or my hypothesis that I make, so there's no I believe or me's, it's a blanket statement that covers everyone. There's always going to be one independent variable. The independent variable is something you're changing to get your desired outcome. And the dependent variable is what you're going to measure as a result of that change. So my hypothesis, to my solution to my problem, is drinking coffee through a straw reduces stains on teeth. See how I didn't put I in there, or we, or me? 
the thing that I'm changing my independent variable is how I'm drinking coffee. So drinking coffee through the straw is my independent variable. What I'm measuring as a result of that change are the stains on my teeth. So stains on my teeth are what I'm measuring and that is considered my dependent variable. You always have one of each of those. You don't want to have multiple variables. So I don't want to say drinking coffee through the straw and whitening my teeth reduces stains on teeth, or let me take my teeth, drinking coffee through a straw and using whitener will reduce stains on teeth. That's the appropriate hypothesis I took the eye of. But there are two variables now. I don't know if it's the drinking coffee through the straw that's going to reduce the stains or the whitener. So you have to make sure that you have one variable at a time that you're testing so you clearly know what is affecting your outcome. The next part of the scientific method is to experiment. So you have to design an experiment that will actually test your independent variable. Is your independent variable actually influencing your dependent variable? Experiments must be done over a long period of time. I can't just drink coffee through a straw one day and say, woohoo, I'm the best scientist, my teeth have less stains on them. I have to do it for a long duration of time, maybe months, months. I have to have many subjects, not just mine, just not, not just me, but several people have to be doing this at the same time. You always have to have a control group. A control group is something that you're going to compare your experiment group to in order to see if your experiment worked. Your control group has to lack the independent variable. So like I said, my independent variable is drinking coffee through a straw. So that's my experimental group, a group of people that are going to constantly drink coffee through a straw. My control group is going to be the same number of people drinking coffee in the at the same time, the same type of coffee, but without the straw. The reason why you have this group drinking coffee without the straw is so you can compare the two groups together. The one using the straw, my independent variable, and the one without the straw. So then we can compare the results at the end to see if there was a real change with this independent variable in place. So it's a use of a comparison. So the experimental group, like I just met, mentioned, has the independent variable. So while you're doing your experiment, you have multiple subjects to do it for a long duration of time. You make everything exactly the same in both groups, except for the independent variable is lacking in the control. And then after your experiment is over, you could draw conclusions. You'll have supported data where you share with the scientific community and say, woohoo, I'm so smart, my experiment worked, and this is the findings that I had. You also have to share your data if it doesn't match. Okay, in good science, whether your results go with your hypothesis or go against your hypothesis, it's really important to share so other people can learn from your, your experiments. If it's not supported, you can redo the experiment and try again. You could tweak your experiment. You can tweak your variables. You can tweak your hypothesis and redo the experiment. After that, you can reject your hypothesis and say, actually, drinking coffee through a straw does not reduce stains on teeth. Or I could create a new one. So these are the aspects in your scientific method. After you have your hypothesis and it's been tested and tested and over a period of time the whole scientific community agrees with this hypothesis, then a hypothesis can become a theory. Often people mistake hypothesis and theory and use theory all the time, but theory means something very specific. So in this slide I'm going to go over the difference between hypothesis and theory. So a hypothesis, like we said, is a possible explanation for a specific observation. Okay, it's an answer to a problem or question. And it's basically an educated guess. What do you think the answer is to this problem or question? A theory, on the other hand, is widely accepted, typically by the whole scientific 
community, they agree to this idea as scientific fact. It's a broad concept. It covers many ideas. It shapes how scientists view the world and how they form their hypotheses and explains why things happen. Okay, so if you think of it, the hypothesis is the beginning of an idea and the theory is when that idea is more concrete. So in order for a hypothesis to become a theory, it must be broad and pertain to a whole body of evidence or ideas, must be extensively tested. One person can't do a test and say, okay, I'm smart, I was correct, and now that's a theory. Many resources or outlets have to test that same idea and come with the same conclusion. It must be supported over time and have a high degree of reliability. And to keep in mind, scientific fact, it changes. So theories may be refuted in the future. Okay, with evidence that contradicts that theory, they could be refuted. So hypothesis and theory, we have the germ theory. The germ theory basically says infectious diseases are caused by microorganisms that can be transmitted from one person to another. This originally was a hypothesis. People believed that life came from non-life, that bacteria just showed up. But that's not true. They know that the bacteria have to be there to begin with, and bacteria can be transmitted from person to person. When these mi uh, microorganisms multiply in their host, they cause disease. So this is a theory, your scientific theory. This has been experimented, this has been observed, and now it's accepted by the whole scientific community that germs are spread via co direct contract from person to person, and then those will grow in the host or the organism that the bacteria infected. So there's also a difference between theories and laws. Scientific law is uniform or a constant fact of nature. For example, the law of gravity. You have all experienced the law of gravity. You've all fallen. <laughs> the Earth is pulling you down to its surface at 9.8 meters per second squared. That is true about everything on this planet. They get drawn to the Earth due to gravitational forces. So that is a law. It describes what happens in the natural world. So an ex example of a theory, or excuse me, example of a law in biology would be the biogenic law. This is the law that all things come from pre-existing living things. And little picture of buggies. So in order for these bugs to be adults, they came from pre-existing cells from their parent bugs. Same as you and me, we came here from sperm and egg uniting to make a one-celled organism called a zygote, and that one cell divided into two, and two cells divided into four, and continued to divide until they made you. Now, if you have children, your sex cell, your egg, or sperm, will be used to construct a new individual. So cells come from pre-existing cells, or life comes from pre-existing life. Okay, so that's the biogenic law. That is accepted by the scientific community. And that ends our lecture today on the scientific method, the difference between hypothesis theory and law.